No nii, tervist. Tere pärast, lõunad. Good afternoon. And uh, I'm really happy to host here front of us uh, three great minds. And as you know, the main point of our discussion this afternoon is uh, which role, for instance, Estonia plays uh, in today's international affairs, including, of course, in the uh, framework and in the environment of uh, the European Union and NATO businesses and developments. We all know that, theoretically, all member states of the European Union and NATO are equal, because most of decisions uh, which are made in both organizations are consensus-based, and at least technically, it means uh, that every country uh, is equal. Uh, although there are some people, and I don't know why, who are still uh, discussing that maybe the bigger powers in Europe, be it Germany, be it France, be it um, some others, uh, well, play still politically bigger role. We're just uh, witnessing uh, that uh, President Macron in Paris hosted uh, Chinese uh, president and also the uh, chairperson of the European Commission or, or president of the European Commission also traveled to Paris to meet the uh, Chinese president over there. Um, but of course, during the last few years, uh, I would say that the role of Estonia and some other uh, countries uh, from eastern or, or central or also northern part uh, of Europe um, changed. Changed because the political situation, the security situation in Europe has also dramatically changed. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Haysborough. Uh, how you see, are at this stage all EU and NATO member states equal, or are there still differences, and which role, for instance, Estonia plays uh, in this picture? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it, and it's always a joy coming back to, to Tallinn. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, 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 I, I never get enough of it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the pleasure is, is very, very real. Uh, I'll start with full disclosure. Some people believe I'm a Frenchman. I have a French passport, it's true, and I'm French. But half of me actually comes from a much greater power called Luxembourg. <laughs> now, when Luxembourg looks at Estonia, it does not see a small country. <laughs> it sees a bigger country than Luxembourg. And uh, even your population is larger than the Luxembourgeois population. Uh, uh, does that give me a dose of empathy? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But it certainly makes me keenly aware of what it means uh, uh, to be considered as a small country as opposed to a large country. What does that mean in practice? Uh, first of all, one must never forget that one is a small country. Uh, of course, if you forget, there will always be somebody who is larger than you to remind you that you are small. Uh, uh, and uh, but that the point I'm making has some very substantial uh, implications. Uh, if I look at Singapore, uh, Singapore, when it trains its diplomats, uh, civil servants in general, in general, the requ on the required leading reading list, number one is a book called The Little Red Dot. Little Red Dot is Singapore on a world map. And the book is all about uh, vulnerability, about what it means to be small. This is one of the keys to Singapore's success. It never indulged in the hubris, let's say, of a country like Qatar, which at one stage acted as if it were a superpower. And it was brutally deflated some years ago and then climb back. Uh, second, the, the second point is that 
if you are a member of NATO, if you are a member of the EU, as you are, one of the duties is that you have to use the opportunity to develop a brand name. Brand names can mean companies, it can mean individuals. Uh, in the case of Luxembourg, brand name was, back in the old days when radio was important, it was Radio Luxembourg. People knew about Luxembourg because, Luxembourg because of Radio Luxembourg. It sounds very trivial, but it meant that Luxembourg was on everybody's mental map in Western Europe. And the same goes for individuals in the process of European construction, Gaston Thorne or Pierre Werner, were outsized personalities which drove part of the process of European integration. So that is something which your membership of the EU and NATO gives you the opportunity to develop on steroids. Because yes, you can climb up on the greasy pole of constructs which are much larger than any of its uh, individual members. And this has security implications. Very practical ones. And I'll say, I'll, 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 I'll quote a very impolite quote which mercifully does not target Estonia as such, but it was meant to target you as well as the other Baltic states. And it's a statement which has been repeated several times by a, prom by a prominent extreme left French politician who actually got, uh, I think it was 19% of the presidential vote in 2016, called Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And the quote is the following. On s'en fout des Lituaniens, tu en connais, toi, des Lituaniens, uh, I don't give a fuck about Lithuanians, and do you know anybody who comes from Lithuania? That was his way of saying that it was a mistake to enlarge the European Union, was a mistake to enlarge NATO, uh, that uh, he felt absolutely no empathy, sympathy, solidarity with the countries of the erstwhile Soviet Union. Uh, and that, that, of course, has implications. And that's why it is incredibly important for you to, as you have done and are doing, putting yourself on the map. So it's not simply about national ego, about even national prosperity, because you, you've done, of course, over the, the last three decades, a fantastic job. Uh, but it's also actually about national security. Uh, believe me, I'm a Luxembourgeois. I know this. Well, thank you for your first remarks. And um, Mr. Vseviov, do you know someone from Lithuania? Vaguely. <laughs> Vaguely a few. I even know a few from Luxembourg and France, actually. Both, both. Okay, you already know three. What was that? Uh, three persons. Was that the question to me? Uh, it was first question. Second one is uh, that, of course, I also I'd like to say that Estonia is not a small country. Estonia yeah. is a compact country. <laughs> Absolutely. So that I always argue with others if they say that, well, Estonia is a small country, this and that. No, 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 no. Esto yeah, but we are, more, we are more compact than you. Yeah, you are, indeed, <laughs> yes. You are. And also you have nice, I would say, neighborhood. At, uh, least, at least these days. Uh, these days. At least these days. Yeah, yeah, we had, we had so a very rough time at the hands. Yeah, but but we, we are going to talk about the future at the yeah. moment, and maybe it's <laughs> more, more bright than the past for Luxembourg in this regard. But, um, Jonathan, how, how you see at this very practical stage, as you come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, which is the role of Estonia in today's, well, European foreign policy, which uh, at this well at this period of time has not the easiest right amplitudes. Thank you, and first of all, thank you for having me. All joking aside, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, be able to address you on this matter of uh, what for Estonia is is great importance. You know, we may not be small when it comes to quantitative uh, data. I think we're roughly at the fifty percent. Uh, level when it comes to UN member states. About half of the member states are actually smaller than we are, population-wise. But being small, I guess, is part of our DNA. This is what every Estonian usually says is the first sentence. Uh, I'm not sure how this is with Luxembourg, 
uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that it's totally different with the Lithuanians. They don't see themselves as small countries. We do. So it's part of our DNA. We need to deal with it. Um, also, as a caveat, uh, I am from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the things that I will say that you like are uh, to be considered as foreign ministry's official positions. The things you don't like that don't make sense are my personal observations. <laughs> um, so that nobody gets in trouble. Um, and, and I'd actually like to start with uh, what is a vague quote um, uh, of uh, a former Icelandic uh, foreign minister. Um, when he had to uh, talk about small states and their contribution to humanity in general. Because statistically, it's more likely that the major scientific, uh, medical uh, breakthroughs, uh, cultural breakthroughs even, uh, more likely that they will come from the, uh, the great powers, the big countries. So what's our added value? And his explanation was that, look, you know, we're, because of the fact that we're small, less tied down by our practical interests, economic interests, or even security interests, and thus can speak more freely and function as a sort of a cannery in the coal mine. That's our added value. He said that in the context of Iceland being the first country in the world to recognize Estonia's and Latvia's and Lithuanians' um, re-emergence uh, from the Soviet occupation. That was his example. Iceland was able to do the right thing and say the right thing before the United States, before France, before anybody else, not because Iceland is smarter, more aware of international affairs, but because Iceland had less practical interests with regard to Soviet relations or, or even European relations writ large. So when we look around the world, uh, we see other small states playing the same role. You mentioned Singapore. Singapore is a leader on matters that relate to multilateralism. The rules-based international order in the United Nations, Singapore is one of the big players. Or uh, Liechtenstein on international law and accountability. Iceland, obviously, on a number of issues. Now, it all sounds extremely glorious, and especially with the benefit of the hindsight. Uh, being a leader and functioning as a cannery in the coal mine is not easy. It's not easy because of two main reasons. First, others may not listen. They, they simply may not listen. In order for them to listen, they first have to notice you. You have to have a certain level of visibility. I think you were talking about that. You have to have that certain level of visibility, but you also have to have a certain level of substantive credibility for anyone to listen to what you have to say. Substantive credibility. Now, it still is a problem because they still won't listen. They will only listen when they absolutely have to listen. We function the same way. We pay attention to French positions or Luxembourg's positions when we have to pay attention to those uh, positions. Estonia has an advantage here because of our seat at the EU table and at the NATO table. And for as long as the EU makes decisions, especially on foreign policy that are based on consensus, there's always this lever that we can use. Not necessarily by using the veto power, but by uh, credibly uh, having others listen to what we have to say. Now, it's still not going to be easy. The moments when Estonia has led Europe or led NATO, we talk about them with pride for good reason. They sound glorious examples of our foreign policies or political leadership successes, but they're only so with the benefit of the hindsight. Part of our DNA as a small country is to never be alone again. By demonstrating leadership, by definition, we put ourselves in a position where we are alone before others follow. You can't lead unless you're alone. So you have to go and be ahead of the pack. And at that moment, it's never certain whether they will actually follow or not. So a, a resource that is often undervalued for small countries especially, is that of courage. Now, if we uh, incentivize mediocrity in our foreign policy or in our public administration in general, we'll never have that courage. We will be making mistakes. There will be moments when we're leading, we're far ahead of the pack, but others won't follow. 
in which case we need to be very careful not to punish those who have put us in that position, lest we not incentivize mediocrity in the future. And I think over the past two, three years, Estonia has done well. I'm biased, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Obviously, I think we've done well. But I think most would agree with us. We've uh, been able to shape Europe's policies vis-a-vis -vis the, the war. Uh, in many cases, also NATO policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the war that is existential for not just us, but for Europe. Um, we've utilized our EU membership and NATO membership in a, um, in a good way. Our prime minister is well known, visible, uh, clearly listened to not only by the um, other political leaders, but also by the international press, which is not insignificant. And I think we have been credible uh, substantively uh, in the sense that we can talk in short sentences and simple slogans. But if necessary, we can back that up by longer speeches or PhD dissertations if necessary. What we say is co coherent and consistent throughout both the slogans that we throw out as well as more substantive uh, discussions. What's helped us get here is that we've spent the past 30 years thinking about these problems that are now at the forefront of European security. So all in all, I think we've done well. This is not to say that we can rest on the laurels and it's never going to be easy. It's always going to be risky, especially for small states because if we want to be relevant, we need to take that leadership role. And almost by definition, taking that leadership role means that we put ourselves ahead of the pack and thus in, a, in an extremely vulnerable uh, position. Thank you, Jonathan Sevio. And uh, this was the official part, as I understood, because I liked everything you said. <laughs> what about your <laughs> private comments? It's a, it, but it's a matter of taste. You cannot speak on behalf of the audience. So for you, this was I, I official. I sense the audience. As you do. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you very much for your encouraging uh, comments. And we proceed with Mr. Uh, Chris Bailey and your views from Amazon Web Services. So, how you see how much Estonian voice and Estonian positions really matter? Tremendously. So, uh, yeah, so Estonia we see as a front runner. You know, I get, uh, get around the world, so I have glo global national security and defense, so I spend a lot of time around the world with, with defense, intelligence, or national law enforcement uh, groups. And Estonia is a front runner. Estonia will continue to be a front runner. Um, and the re in just having the voice in, in the context of, of what uh, my colleagues had mentioned. You know, what I've seen is um, we have, there's, there's countries with, this is actually my home country, United States of America, seems to have unlimited resources around a lot of things, especially in technology areas, which, um, and, and inside of Amazon, we have these leadership principles. And one of them is frugal, frugality. And it, you'd think it means we're cheap, but it doesn't mean we're cheap. It means we're scrappy. It means we're innovative. And unlimited resources can stifle innovation, can stifle new ideas. And I see Estonia as a front runner with new ideas, uh, frugal with resources, not cheap, you know, uh, spend money where it's, where it's important, but continue to invest in new ideas and grow new ideas. And, not, and the courage to lead, I think, is, is a key point as well. Um, when it comes to uh, kind of thinking about how conflicts extend a, a, across borders, or um, the policies around that. Uh, again, Estonia has been a front runner in that, finding ways to move data to safe places, um, to make sure it's safe. Uh, we see that playing out in Ukraine as well, where uh, all of a sudden they needed to move central government capabilities outside of borders. Um, you know, you, you look at that policy and it's, it's new and scary to a lot of countries around Europe and countries outside of Europe as well. You know, people want to see uh, their server on their land, you know, uh, on their soil, and you know, uh, can have a big, uh, big target on it too. But, um, but moving the data outside of borders, uh, leveraging uh, technology uh, for government, for de even defense, those types of uh, approaches are are critical to uh, uh, to survival, to security, to national security. 
and we see Estonia leading in, in those uh, big thoughts along the way. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and if we now look a little bit closer at the recent changes also in the uh, European and also in, in NATO policies, um, then I well recall that years and years also we here from Estonia told to our good partners that EU needs, for example, strong common Russia policy. But still, we were not too happy with outcome. Really, there was actually no, I would say, no real common uh, foreign policy of the EU vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia long years. And then 24th of February 2022 happened, uh, the new wave of Russian aggression against Ukraine. And now, after two plus years after this sad date, I would say that now finally we have common Russia policy. And these days uh, we have similar discussion also in the EU that, well, EU needs common China policy. But I would say that there is no real common China policy. So that it's very much similar to the situation we had with Russia a few years ago. Um, Jonathan Vseviov, <laughs> what do you think was the main reason we see these days more or less common Russia policy and what should happen, we will also see common China policy. So I think the glass is half full or half empty, depending on your personal taste. I'll go back to the uh, early days of the, uh, of, of the big war, um, Russia's uh, escalation on February 24th, 2022. And you all remember, I mean, immediately after that, uh, it became the norm in Europe to say that we should have listened to you. We should have listened to the Baltic states. I think many even gave speeches saying it was, it was already back then only partially satisfying uh, to listen to this. Uh, because obviously we had been right in the 2000s. The problem was we were still right back then when talking about the future. We're still right today. And just by saying that we should have listened to you yesterday, I mean, if this takes up half of the oxygen uh, and leaves us no room to discuss what to do today, when we still are fairly convinced we're still right, I mean, it's a half empty, glass half empty situation for us. We needed no validation. Part of the reason why Europe woke up, or is, I think, to a certain extent, still in the process of waking up, relates to the shock of Putin's decision to actually uh, do what he did. Um, the half full part is that at least we're waking up now. We're waking up. You read European leaders' speeches, it's not just us anymore, alone uh, only, describing this war as being existential. I mean, President Macron recently, uh, von der Leyen almost on a daily basis, Borrell almost on a daily basis. And that's a good thing. We're still in the process of waking up, though. When it comes to uh, uh, practical sort of implementation of policy, uh, even symbolic uh, steps uh, are difficult for us as Europe to take in a coordinated manner. Today is uh, Putin's or was Putin's inauguration. Out of the 27 EU member states, I think 20 or 21 did not attend. Symbolic, not a big deal. But we were unable to uh, um, demonstrate unity of action, even on a, a matter of such purely symbolic uh, significance. So I think even when it comes to Russia policy, we have a long way to go. The one thing that should keep people worried is our inability to define strategic goals vis-a-vis -vis uh, Russia or vis-a-vis -vis the outcome of this war. Uh, you listen to what we say. I mean, it's not Estonia's case. Estonia has defined what we want as an outcome from this war. You look at official NATO texts, you look at EU texts, you listen to big speeches. Uh, we're like cats uh, circling the, uh, uh, the hot uh, food. 
uh, for as long as it takes, for as long as we can, for as long as necessary. What do we want? Well, the reason why we're being vague is because we've had a hard time defining a common strategic goal, even vis-a-vis -vis this, uh, this war. Uh, and with regard to China, we're even, we're, we're even in a worse position. Because with regard to China, we haven't had that sort of a shock wake-up moment that we had in 2022. Now, the uh, final thing I'll say on this is that, just to underline the point that I'm an optimism, optimist, is that we have been getting better. The glass is half full, and it's getting fuller by the day. Uh, the big question is whether we have enough time to build up that European self-confidence, European ability to act strategically on the international stage, whether we have time enough before the true test of this uh, European concept arrives. We're all racing not only against time, we need to be aware of the fact that on the international stage, we're playing against other teams, opposing teams, and they have a vote too. And what they're trying to do is undermine our unity, undermine our policy. Um, that, unfortunately, is still an open question, whether or not we'll be able to get our act together in time. Mr. Haysbor, uh, well, as you are very much aware, uh, Estonia and some other countries advocated, I guess, already last at least 15 years uh, for this, that all NATO member states and also at this later stage also EU member states should spend at least 2% of GDP for defence. And it has also been clear NATO recommendation and uh, during recent years also not only recommendation but in fact decision but still, Luxembourg is 0.7%. <laughs> Does it mean that, well, Estonia's uh, recommendations slash NATO recommendations doesn't matter? Here, here I, I dropped the Luxembourgeois passport and used my French one. <laughs> uh, no, ser seriously, first, first of all, uh, uh, one of uh, Estonia's comparative advantages has indeed been the quality of its analysis concerning Russia. I, I, for, the, for a number of years, I've been reading the annual reports of your, the public reports of your security services, and the quality of that is absolutely incredible. Uh, I, I won't go into details, we don't have time, uh, but uh, any, anybody who hasn't been reading them should actually be reading them, and should have been, and should have been reading them. Uh, uh, a, there is a quality in those reports uh, which can be encapsulated by the word dispassionate, which is an unusual word to use when dealing with uh, such a tense and fraught situation as the one opposing Russia with its immediate uh, neighbours. And yet you manage to produce dispassionate analysis, which happens to be correct. Second, uh, second point. Uh, on, uh, on, on defense spending, uh, there, there actually has been the discussion between the Luxembourgeois and the number of member states, including the US, by the way. And they sort of came to the conclusion that having three times more Jeeps in, and uh, 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 350 more soldiers in the Luxembourgeois army would not actually uh, make very good sense compared to the other stuff. Uh, notably in the field of uh, uh, the security uses of outer space, for example, which is one of the niches in which the Luxembourgeois are deeply invested. I know we were talking about the qualities of being small. Well, uh, being small means being mobile, being able to set, being trailblazers, and being able to select the niches in which you are going to run faster than anybody else. The Luxembourgeois niches and the Estonian niches have actually been different, but they have actually been uh, both performing uh, quite well. Uh, to get to the nub of the Russia issue, uh, my starting point, strange, uh, this may sound strange, does not go back to the 24th of February. It actually goes back to the month of June 2020. Why June 2020? Because that's when the member states decided to give the Commission the responsibility for doing something for which it was apparently incompetent, in legal terms, 
incompetent in organizational and practical terms and absolutely necessary, which was to devise a strategy for countering COVID, and notably the vaccine strategy. That was a proof of concept moment, that the Commission could actually do stuff and not simply elaborate framework, frameworks for policies, like the common agricultural policy or God knows what. Uh, the Commission became an operational device. And that lesson, I think, informed much of what followed. Because all of a sudden, when the 24th of February happened, 2022, you immediately had folks in the Commission saying, yeah, maybe we should get into the arms business. This could not have happened without the COVID moment. So it wasn't simply about Russia, if I can put it that way. But it actually meant that by April, May of 2022, uh, uh, initiatives were taken uh, to make the European Union play an active and operative role in the support to Ukraine. Not as much as should be done, uh, not as quickly as should be done and so on, but uh, talking about the EU institutions as such, the Eureka moment actually antedated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the invasion. Russia is obviously difficult to deal with, to put it mildly, but the terms of the equation are simple. That is, we know what the stakes are. I need not remind you guys of what they are. Uh, we know we pretty much know what needs to be done about them. And defense spending is definitely part of the picture, and it's finally being taken seriously, or so it seems. Uh, 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 but, it, but it's straightforward. The China issue is much more complicated. It's not simple, the Russia issue, uh, the China issue. Uh, for a reason which I would never have expected to have to state because it simply did not exist until the election of Joe Biden. And that is, China and the US have very similar mercantilist trade policies and a very similar approach to the security implications of trade. They are opposite, they are opposed, obviously, understandably and should be, because China is communist country, the United States isn't, uh, and hopefully will never be so. Uh, but from the standpoint of Europe, we are caught in the middle. And I'm not talking about equidistance or stuff like that. I don't advocate equidistance. But when you have China saying that they're going to spend $1.6 trillion in subsidies to the so-called new productive forces, biomanufacturing, green tech, and so on. And you have the United States saying, we're going to spend close to 900 billion on the, uh, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act and another 200 billion or so on the, chip, on the CHIPS Act. Well, how does Europe swim in the face of this kind of competition? While at the same time, for security and strategic reasons, which are totally understandable from the US standpoint and perfectly inimical from the Chinese standpoint. Each one tells us, you cannot trade on this, you cannot trade on that with the other guy. And you, have the, 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 you get to situations which, are, which would be funny if they were not heavily loaded. Uh, uh, Europe's third largest firm in terms of uh, a stock market valuation is the ASML of the Netherlands, which is a key component of the value chain of TSMC in Taiwan, the world's largest cutting-edge chip product producer. So you have the American ambassador at lunchtime telling the Dutch, uh, uh, ASML must not deliver this or that. Uh, and then in the evening, you have the Chinese ambassador telling the Dutch, oh, if you refuse to sell this or that to us, uh, you will be heavily punished. No more, no more Dutch cheese for China. I'm making, I'm making that part up, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, these kinds of situations are going to make it devilishly difficult for us 
to remain competitive on the one hand, remaining good allies of the US on the other, uh, because we need to remain good allies, notably in the face of the Russian challenge, while at the same time uh, uh, not uh, succumbing to what will ve may very well happen, and that is there will be forces in Germany and in some other countries who will say we have to practice equidistance between the United States and China. This, this is actually the most complicated strategic challenge which the Europeans will be facing over the next few years. Russia is hard, but it's simple. And you know, you're as a practitioner in the arts of uh, what you are doing at Amazon, you know the difference between hard and simple and complicated and, and, and equally hard. Well, yes, of course. Uh, security situation of Europe is, I guess, number one issue for us here in, in Estonia and for many other uh, countries. We have conventional war going on on the European soil, but it's not just conventional war. We also have hybrid war going on, and it's not only in Ukraine or between Russia and Ukraine. Hybrid war is today in all over in Europe. We have several examples uh, what Russians are using against Europe, against the European Union, against also other Western democracies as part of their hybrid war. And of course, one of the hybrid war elements is uh, cyber, cyber defense. And we also have here our own Estonian story related to cyber defense. Um, and I guess, Mr. Bailey, it's also good to ask from you as you deal very much in uh, in, in online and online services and, and web and so on. Uh, how you see Estonian already historical role, but also role for the future, what concerns cyber, cyber security and, and hybrid, well, war, which unfortunately is, is going on more and more visibly. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple things there. First of all, Estonia is obviously a leader in cyber. We, were, uh, we participated in Lock Shields, the uh, NATO exercise here, uh, just over the last couple of weeks. Um, and you know, provide our platform for that. Work very closely with NATO on that. Um, you know, Estonia does a lot to uh, make sure that online capabilities are online and available. That's also what the cloud can do for you. And so, uh, as you know, just extension of the Ukrainian story, as they moved uh, government, as they moved banks, as they moved educational institutions to the cloud. Um, it also created uh, a similar cyber defense. So we, we defend, uh, you know, uh, a majority of the attacks around the world are actually bouncing off of, uh, you know, our cloud. Um, and whether it's AWS or it's Amazon.com or whether it's uh, governments that are on the cloud or banks that are on the cloud, um, that's something we're very, very efficient at. And uh, security is, is, the bar on security is raised in the cloud. Uh, to, to rewind just a little bit, though, um, to talk a little bit about the rear view mirror, uh, you know, um, are we prepared a little bit around Europe and, you know, uh, are there lessons learned? Um, I was at a conference probably nine months ago in the UK, and the question was more about UK and has U UK learned the lessons from, from Ukraine? Um, and, you know, how to think about if you're... Uh, if your data centers are gone or if your data is gone, what happens? And if you look around at a lot of different countries, most countries, it's obvious that you need to take some kind of action, but most, country, most countries haven't taken action, you know? And it's, it's not just about moving the data somewhere it's, it's safer. It's also all about what you can do with that data and how you can defend that data like we just talked about, or how you can build advanced capabilities on that data, like our artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data solutions, the other things that you can do with that data to improve government services or to improve defense capabilities. Um, and so it's actually a step up um, that we saw happen in Ukraine. What, what happened, what, but what we see in other countries is they're still like, yeah, 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 I get it. Makes a lot of sense, but everybody's dragging their feet which I think goes back to kind of the crucible event conversation, you know, whether it's COVID or whether it's, um, 
you know, February uh, 24th, like those types of events, all of a sudden everybody wakes up and says, yeah, 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 we should have done this. We should have done this earlier. I just don't know what it is in us that waits. I don't know what it is uh, where you can, there's additional capabilities and addition, whether it's citizen services or whether it's defense capabilities, it's right there. Like, let's step into it and let's figure out how to, how to use some of these and get ahead of the curve. It doesn't need to be a big cost. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, something that's, uh, you know, we don't have to wait for the big thing to happen. There's so much we can do today. So I, I just think uh, when we kind of look at the, either whether it's the cyber conversation or, uh, or other capabilities, I don't know what it is in us that just, just waits, just waits. So I, I just compel anybody in here to like, let's just take a step in. Let's, let's figure this out before, um, before we have to. Hmm. Well, I guess here is full agreement with, uh, with this statement because it's very human. Start to act only if already something really bad happened, although we basically knew it already well, a long time before that it may happen. And uh, the same pattern, unfortunately, as we also see uh, in the states, in the countries, in the international organizations, be it EU or others. Uh, so that, that's why I guess that this idea that also Europe finally has to do much more for its own security, for its own uh, well-being, uh, I, I, I hope that now finally we, we will also take it much more seriously than, than so far. We have 9 minutes 16 seconds left. It means there will be final question for each of you three minutes maximum for the answer. And we spoke a little bit um, about this that uh, during the last two years, because of course, sad circumstances, because of new wave of Russian aggression in Ukraine, Estonia's uh, position and Estonia's voice has been maybe much more credible than ever before. Uh, people, well, listen us, listen our politicians and analysts, uh, but my question is about the future. The tense uh, relationship with the Russian regime continues. The security threats are still there. China, as we uh, analyzed, is more and more complicated. There is more and more potential for conflict between, well, democracies on the one hand and harsh authoritarian regimes on the other. How you would see which kind of role Estonia, on this basis we now, I would say, achieved, uh, should play uh, with our allies, be it in the EU or, or in NATO? Because it's very easy for a compact country just to sit and watch what others are doing, but I guess we are not satisfied with this rather passive uh, role. So that where you see realistically Estonia uh, should have its position in, in all these future developments together with our allies and maybe now start with you. Uh-oh. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, a, a leader, as, as we talked about leadership before and the coverage around leadership, I'll focus a little bit on NATO. Um, you know, when it comes to space and the future of space with NATO or whether it comes to cloud and how we think about uh, classified data in clouds and kind of future looking um, capabilities, um, I've seen NATO more and more uh, look to member states to lead the way. Rather than waiting for consensus and making sure everybody's good, more recently they've said, hey, this is our intent and this is where we're going, and we need some member states to get out ahead of us and show us the way. And then, and then because they look at that as a better path to success, because they seem to be paralyzed in a lot of these decisions. So Estonia plays a key, key role in that. You know, the way that you're forward leaning and the way that you, uh, you have the tech base, um, the, you know, your startup community, um, your agility and your ability to pivot to new ideas, I think is uh, so, so important. You have these other games going on about, you know, the big, the big guys in NATO going, hey, we're the boss, or you have the other ones going, if it's not our country, then we're not interested. But then you have a whole bunch of other countries that are coming up with new ideas and trying to lean forward. And Estonia is an amazing, amazing place to be a leader, a thought leader in that and lead the charge. Thank you very much. Mr. Hesber. Let's start with two factoids. Uh, first factoid is that Luxembourg is the uh, backup of Estonia's data. Uh, 
uh, uh, that is one thing that we have in common, as far as those two are concerned. Uh, what is done with the data, I don't know. Uh, I assume that may be classified. Uh, second factoid, Estonia, I think, has a defense budget which is now 3.2% of GDP. That is more than the United States of America. American friends, please take note before you start asking for ever more money uh, for Mr. Trump's protection racket, because that's pretty much the way Trump presents his own view of burden sharing. Estonia is actually an, a, good, a, a great example for the United States. The uh, statement is, is the following. Uh, we now have the choice between two strategies in Ukraine. We are no longer in a situation of strategic indetermination. We have the German-American strategy, which is one of self-deterrence, uh, the fear of any form of escalation, uh, the refusal to commit to accession to NATO. Uh, that is one strategy. What it leads to, I'm not sure. And there is another strategy, which I think the French, the Estonians, and a few others share. And that is a strategy where there has to be a path uh, lined out for the accession to NATO as well as to the European Union of uh, Ukraine, uh, that we cease to make self-denying ordinances, self-deterring or, uh, uh, ordinances like those which we have been doing constantly since the beginning and even before the beginning of the war. No troops in Ukraine, uh, no aircraft in Ukraine, no air launch cruise missiles in Ukraine, no tanks in Ukraine, no uh, heavy weaponry in Ukraine. Uh, we've gone through the whole list. Uh, we usually changed our minds down the way after a number of useless thousands or dozens of thousands of deaths. That is not a good strategy. And uh, to move to a strategy of strategic ambiguity, uh, so I think we actually have a, f a fairly clear choice. The matter may not be in your hands or in ours. It may be in the hand of the American electorate on 5th of November of this year. We, like Vladimir Putin, uh, will be waiting for what will come out of the ballot boxes in the United States of America. And we have to prepare for whatever the outcome may be. Thank you. And Jonathan Seriov. In three minutes, I'll have to be extremely blunt and straightforward. Everything you, you have more than we had. Uh, well, <laughs> because almost, I, almost, others were very polite. <laughs> Urmas <laughs> probably wants to do a wrap-up as well. So two and a half minutes now. Uh, everything will depend on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. The question isn't whether this war will end. All wars end. This war, too, will one day end and then peace will break out. The sort of peace we'll have will depend on how this war ends. It will either become the norm that a larger state can change its small neighbor's borders with force or not. It will either become the norm that a larger state can, uh, as part of an agreement with other large states perhaps, uh, decide the core foreign policy and uh, foreign and domestic political choices of its small neighbor or not. Aggression as a tool of statecraft will either be re-legitimized or not. That's why we describe this war as being existential to us and to the European idea. Now, one thing this war, once it ends, won't do, it won't end history. The list of uh, problems that Europe will be faced with is mind-boggling. Ukraine's reconstruction, Ukraine will be reconstructed. The question is who will do it under whose rules? Very many millionaires will become billionaires in the process. The question is whether Ukraine will be reconstructed according to Western, democratic, free market-based, rules-based order system, uh, regulations, or, or something else. We're going to have to manage a Russia that will be on our borders. Having won or having lost, it's going to be an issue. We're going to have a Middle East that is on fire, an Africa that is about to explode. We're going to have a China to deal with, and all the global problems that I'm not even going to mention. The question is whether we will face those problems as a, as a united Europe in alliance with our American friends, or not, and that will depend on uh, the outcome in Ukraine. Now, we talked about the human, uh, very human um, um, 
way of taking the easier course, uh, avoiding the hard choices? Why haven't we learned from past mistakes? Why does it take for there to be a, a seminal moment for us to wake up? Well, it's human. It's human. Uh, there's no need to be frustrated over it. We're always, as humans in this country, is going to take the easier option. If we want to lead Europe to take what we consider to be the right option, we can't just simply argue that it's the easier. If it's not, we have to demonstrate that the alternatives are even worse. Napoleon said that leaders are those who deal in hope. There are two tools in our disposal, hope and fear. We need to be able to utilize those tools to get us to take the right turns, make the right choices, uh, even if they seem painful in the short term. And I think this is uh, what Estonia has tried to do and will have to do in the future as well. Reminding everyone that if we take the Chamberlainian option, we're going to be the ones reminding people that you're no Churchill. I think for as long as that is of any value in European politics, we can get our job done. Dear audience, thank you very much for your time and interest. Thank you that you came. Dear gentlemen, thank you very much for your very adequate analysis and, and comments. It was pure pleasure. But the conference continues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.